today's lecture, I'm invited and Joe graciously accepted in spite of a hugely busy travel and other kind of schedule. Um, Mr. Joseph Kelly, Vice President for Mission and Advancement at Merrimack College, which is a college also run by the Augustinians or sponsored by the Augustinians in the Merrimack Valley north of Boston. Joseph is Associate Professor in Religious and Theological Studies. He also serves as Dean of Experiential Learning and is the founder of the Center for Augustinian Study and Legacy at Merrimack College. Most recently, he's been appointed as director of the Center for the Study of Jewish, Christian, Muslim Relations, um, a new challenge. Mm. <laughs> Joseph Villanova graduate, so he knows us. Um, graduated in 1970, mm. not quite as little old a guy as I am, but uh, close. Um, with a BA in philosophy, summa cum laude. Um, he also has rather wide, wide background and interest, clinical psychologist, musician, author of several books. You'll find copies of them on the table that the bookstore has graciously um, agreed to make available. Um, so I won't read out all the titles of those. You can see them on the table. Um, and his talk today, is called the is called ecology through augustine's eyes give us sustainability lord but not yet <laughs> since um joe has been a good friend for a long time um all of this academic and uh, professional stuff is stuff that i needed to say um but i'm most pleased because a good friend who with whom i have been able to work often by email and in other ways on the study of and the understanding of Augustine. Uh, it's really a pleasure to welcome you back to Villanova to um, have the pleasure of hearing you speak live about Augustine. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. Hi, everyone. Um, when Augustine decided to retire, he, there was a priest appointed to eventually succeed him as bishop. It was it Evodius, Carl, Father Carl? And uh, the first time Evodius got up to uh, preach, you can imagine um, succeeding Augustine as a preacher. So he said those famous words, the sparrow chirps, the swan is silent. And there are some swans here in the audience today. Alan is a, a world-known, internationally known Augustine scholar, as is Father Carl, Father Joe, just got back from Rome, min newly minted Augustine scholar, and some scientists in the audience. It's, it's very intimidating for me. So with that disclaimer, I'll, uh, I'll begin. You've been lied to all your life, he said. And today I'm here with good news. I'm going to tell you the truth. I went to an assisted living facility in New Hampshire, not far from where I live, to visit a dear friend, a retired biologist, a um, former colleague, to have lunch with her. And while waiting in the, li the lobby area, I heard those words. So my curiosity was piqued, and I looked around the corner, and there was a preacher of some denomination standing in front of a room about this size, except they were all in wheelchairs or with walkers. So I said, well, what is the great lie that's been perpetrated on these people? So he continued, those fancy professors and academic elitists at which point I pulled a little bit behind the corner. <laughs> they tell you that you are all descendant from apes. And I'm here to tell you the good news. This is a lie. We are God's children, descendant directly from Adam and Eve. So don't let them upset you with their talk of evolution. They all lie like the serpent in the Garden of Eden. So at that point, my friend, uh, Mary Lee, tapped me on the shoulder, and she said, heard enough? 
and we left these, this captive audience to the ministrations of their preacher. This afternoon, I'd like to cultivate some common ground, a small patch of common ground on which religion and science can meet for dialogue. My recent encounter with the preacher in New Hampshire reminds us that the relationship between science and religion is not an easy one. When Galileo and his astronomical observations in the 17th century seemed to prove what Copernicus had been arguing in the previous century, the church, the, you know, that the earth revolved around the sun, uh, the church was quick to condemn his ideas and silence his voice. He had contradicted scripture. In the mid 19th century, Darwin's origin of the species sparked a battle between science and religion. And that battle continues today in assisted living facilities, in uh, political caucuses, in school systems, in zealous religious sects. Around the world, there are actually so-called creation research societies. And their goal is to discredit uh, the theory of evolution. The European Parliament recently called it a war on revolution, evolution. Opposition to evolutionary theory is not a Christian monopoly. Conservative movements within Islam roundly reject Darwinian theory as antithetical to their faith. Significant majorities in many, if not most, Muslim countries accept an Islamic variety of creationism and along with their Christian Christian counterparts remain suspicious or overtly opposed to any evolutionary theory. All this despite assertions by Islamic scholars that the Holy Quran is not in conflict with scientific theory. All this despite publication of documents by uh, Rome and by other Christian denominations that evolution does not contradict the expression of meaning and religious purpose that we find in, in the book of Genesis. Now these are controversies over our past as a species. Enter 21st century genetics, neuroscience, some of you are nursing students, these are subjects you're su studying I'm sure, uh, nanotechnology, biotechnology, artificial intelligence, the options that we have and will continue to have regarding our future as a species are bound to generate much more moral controversy. It'll make controversy over evolution seem like child's play. When scientific discovery contradicts an authoritative text of religion or a specific teaching of religion, conflict ensues. When science leads to technologies that threaten our religious values or virtues, culture wars break out. On the other side, many scientists are as dismissive of religion and, and its dogmas as anti-intellectual, inquisitorial, or dangerous. The British biologist Richard Dawkins, I'm sure you know of Richard, uh, a militant atheist by his own proud admission, wrote that, quote, Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. He calls religion a delusion as dangerous to humankind as smallpox. Faith is a virus of the mind. The American neuroscientist Sam Harris argues that science by itself can ade adequately solve all of our moral ethical issues. Religion has failed at that and is no longer necessary to bolster morality. Though most scientists are not as uh, aggressive as Dawkins or Harris, surveys consistently show about 50% of American scientists, especially those in the academy, are atheist or agnostic. 
that's much higher percentage than the, than the average population. Despite all of these disagreements, there are many people who search for common ground between religion and science. Einstein thought that religion and science are not only compatible, they are complementary. His famous statement, science without religion is lame, and religion without science is blind. In his book, Finding Darwin's God, the biologist Ken Miller from Brown University argues against Dawkins directly for the compatibility of Christian faith and evolution. In fact, Professor Miller has been here twice and he delivered the first Lamb lecture almost eight years ago. Jennifer Wiseman is one of NASA's, NASA's uh, leading scientists. She's president of the American Scientific Affiliation. This is an organization of scientists, um, Catholic and Protestant, who are working to find common ground for science and religion. Here at Villanova, you also consider science and religion compatible. You're trying to start a dialogue. Uh, just when I was an undergraduate here, a number of the science teachers in biology and chemistry and physics were Augustinians. Okay? And if you look at the history of the Augustinian order, you'll find uh, many famous scientists in their own century. Uh, the Spanish Andres de Ordoneta was a, a mathematician and an astronomer and a navigator, uh, worked for the Spanish crown. Manuel Blanco, a botanist who did a lot of work in the Philippines, and of course Gregor Mendel, the so-called father of genetics. So the lives and the works of these Augustinians presume some type of compatibility between religion and science. Father Al has told me you have a campus conversation now going on about the possibility of a, uh, a major, an academic major in science and the humanities. Science and the humanities. Uh, so you're, you're looking for a curricular, to sustain in your curriculum uh, this conversation between science and religion. Where, how do faith and reason, spirit and matter, ethics and, te and technology intersect with questions and answers? So what I'd like to do this afternoon is just make one small contribution to that cultivation of common ground between science and religion. To start, I'd like to point out what I see are three intersections, three places where science and religion cross. Uh, the first intersection is that of content or subject matter. Again, going back to uh, Dan Bra uh, Ken Miller's work, Finding Darwin's God. In that work, he specifically takes on Dawkins and he argues that in evolutionary theory, we have a uh, a strong scientific counterpart to the whole notion of human freedom. That's an example of content. Content. Uh, the famous Anglican priest, John Polkinghorne, uh, who's a physicist and, and a priest, uh, tries to establish a dialogue with metaphysics and theology uh, working out of his discipline of physics. The second intersection of science and religion is in the area of method. So first content, but method. How many of you are familiar with hermeneutics from your studies in class? Okay, it's mostly the older people who raise their hand. You'll come to it, right? Hermeneutics is a study of method. How, how, do, you, how do you interpret what you read? And a couple of centuries ago, uh, scientists, uh, from a number of different scientific disciplines, started to critique the Bible, the biblical text, and saying you need to look at it, not literally, but use science, use history, use geography, use the study of culture, social sciences and hard sciences, to understand the text. And this is called historical critical interpretation of the text. Um, and that has revolutionized the way that we approach the study of religious texts, specifically the, the Bible. Uh, it also, also in terms of studying Augustine's texts, right? scientific method there. Over the past 
50, 50 years or so, hermeneutics has sort of, sort of done a U-turn back and is now critiquing scientific method. It revolutionized theological method, but now uh, certain philosophers of science are using it to critique scientific method. Very controversial. Um, you may be familiar with Thomas Kuhn and his critique of the history of science. Michael Pola Polanyi, Poyer, Paul Feuerabend, German name. Uh, while all of this is very controversial and sometimes scientists are not comfortable with it, you can see that on the level of method, there's an opportunity for dialogue. But I want to move to a third intersection where I think uh, we can develop some common ground. It lies beyond content and I think it underlies method. I call it uh, the volitional level, the level of will, of choice. And I've totally forgot about my slides. Okay, we've talked about all of that already. Content, method, volition. At this level, we study what happens to the scientist or the theologian when they experience a significant, irrevocable, and radical change in how they think or in the position they take regarding a theory in their discipline. So my presumption is that all persistent, astute thinkers, whatever their discipline, eventually undergo significant changes in the way they think and how they think within their discipline. Right? Now, I hope that's not too large an assumption. It's happened to me, I presume it's happened to everybody. Right? We all have assumptions or beliefs that sooner or later, either gradually, sometimes suddenly, are undermined by our encounter with the thought of another person or the theories of another school. What we have accepted as the norm, what we have assumed, is decentered, thrown off, off kilter. A new scientific, scientific discovery or a new theological expression breaks through or even breaks down what we have heretofore thought. If we have the courage to admit what is happening to us and to our worldview, our Weltanschauung, we can then make the decision, the act of volition, right, to reorient ourselves and renegotiate our categories of thought. We can choose to do the work of integrating this new information or this new perspective into our way of thinking, into our presuppositions. We search for new language to express new insights. We make the choice somehow to deal with these new and sometimes radically new experiences and insights so that we can continue to grow and learn. Let's take some examples. Uh, a friend of mine works at the Jocelyn Center, the Diabetes Center in Boston. Great, you nurses uh, should know about that. Uh, for years, she's worked with the commonly accepted theory that being overweight contributes directly, directly to diabetes. Now, certainly, there's a correlation between weight and the disease. However, recently, within the past year or so, uh, a professor at the Boston University School of Medicine, Barbara Corky, who's a biochemist, biochemist, has challenged that assumption, the assumption that weight and lifestyle are the primary cause of diabetes. Her research shows, this is fascinating, that food additives such as monoglycerides and saccharin, remember, prevalent in the food chain over the past 40 years or so, which correlates with the growth in diabetes, these food additives stimulate beta cells to produce insulin, insulin at inappropriate times. Revolutionary. The, this makes it hard for the cells to take up glucose, and so it implicates these food additives in the development of the disease. Now, this is causing 
uh, some controversy at the Jocelyn Clinic, as you can imagine. It challenges the science that identifies obesity as the major cause. It also, by the way, helps recontextualize our social uh, prejudices against obesity. So the work of this persistent biochemist, Barbara, by the way, uh, only got into uh, her science later in life, in her 40s and 50s, and into the academy rather late. Uh, she's decentering the assumptions of the research scientists at the Jocelyn Clinic. They have to think about their theory in different ways. They have to redesign their experiments. Uh, and she says this has not been an easy transition. People are invested in the accepted theory, deeply invested. There's money in this, right? Another example, and this comes from um, my colleagues in physics at uh, Merrimack. Uh, we have uh, civil and electrical engineering programs. And with the civil engineers, our physics professors love to introduce them to uh, quantum mechanics because, and I am no physicist, but I, I find this field absolutely uh, titillating. You know, in, in the macro world, we have our accepted assumption, assumptions about time and space and uh, causality and connection, assumptions which do not apply in the, in the nano world of quantum mechanics, right? Uh, and he, uh, one of our physics professors, Craig, Looney. Uh, they love to get the civil engineers, because civil engineers are themselves built to build bridges. So they want to deal with how much does that weigh? What's this force? How do they intersect? What stress will be on the structure? And when the physics professors start talking about luons and leptons and quarks that don't behave in any way that a, a good civil engineer might expect, uh, they get upset. Now, to be fair, we know that Einstein himself struggled with Heisenberg's uncertainty, uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics. The father of rel relativity wrestled in his older years with the idea of randomness. God does not play dice. Right? Referring back to the church's condemnation of uh, Galileo, very interesting, uh, Joseph Ratzinger, Benedict XVI uh, gave a paper in Rome in the early 90s, and he, he quoted Paul Feyerabend, the philosopher of science. Feyerabend, who's, who's very controversial, said, uh, well, you know, in many ways the church was right in its condemnation of Galileo. And he said, what? Uh, and Benedict quotes, quoted him, and he says, the church was not responding to Galileo's scientific theory because it simply opposed their religion, the testimony of scripture, that the earth was the center. The church was opposing his, science, his new theory of heliocentrism because it upset not only the church hierarchy, but the scientific hierarchy of the day, and for that fact, for that matter, the social hierarchy. So the church was out in front uh, expressing the reluctance of accepting a new theory at all, at many, many different levels. Now, to his credit, Benedict says this is no reason for justifying the church's condemnation of Galileo, but it shows the complexity of the situation. Uh, so this decentering of assumptions, this challenge to any accepted expression of belief, whether it happens to religion or to theologians, uh, is what I want to concentrate on. And, and I'm going to start to use the word theologian now. And by theologian, I mean this. It, it's, it's kind of a practical definition of the word, not Father Al or Father Joe or Father Carl. Uh, a theologian is, as I use it, any believer who systematically seeks a deeper understanding of the teachings or the traditions of her or his faith. In other words, any believer who takes the time and makes the space to think about what they believe. That's what I mean by theologian. You don't have to be a professional theologian. You, if you're students at Villanova, you should all be theologians in some way. All right? uh, let me give a few examples. 
uh, we took some from science, Barbara Corky at, at Boston University and the Jocelyn Clinic and our uh, Corky physicist, uh, from theology. A number of years ago, I was teaching a class in uh, Hebrew Bible, and I started talking about a hermeneutics, uh, about, about hermeneutics and different ways of interpreting scriptural text. So we were looking at Genesis, a book about creation, and I was taking an historical, critical approach, not a literal approach. It was a large class of about 40 students, and uh, it was a long, it was a three-hour class. So after an hour and 20 minutes or so, we took a break, and there she was. She started at the back of a long room, and she was making her way to me like a bee to a, its hive, and I said, oh, and she stormed down the aisle, and I could see, it was like the Red Sea parting. The students just didn't want anything to do with her. She's about this tall, and she came up and in a very loud voice said, I am appalled by the way you are treating the Holy Word of God. And I, <laughs> I said, oh. At that point, everybody else had left the room. Uh, I was decentering her assumptions about how you read Scripture. She was uh, from a, actually I found out later, she was from a Mormon background, and th that was not the way you read scripture. She had just moved to Massachusetts, so the poor kid, I mean, coming from Utah to Massachusetts, that's enough to send anyone uh, into orbit. But she could not tolerate that way of reading the text. I don't know if she, she stayed with it, uh, but that, that night she wasn't, would have nothing of it. Christian theology today, your theology professors here will, will tell you, is being decentered in many ways. Feminist thought, Eastern religious thought, Eastern philosophies, uh, tribal and native cultures are all finding a voice in the theological conversations, uh, Christian conversations. So theologians like scientists, know what it means to be decentered, know what it means to have their assumptions challenged, the, their presuppositions put aside, right? their worldviews undermined. So what I'm proposing, this is common ground for religion and science, not content, that is an important area, Method is another important area, but what I'm trying to concentrate on today is looking at this experience of significant, irrevocable, and radical change in a person's way of thinking as something that happens to both scientists and theologians, B those who are expert in their scientific discipline and those who think carefully, thoughtfully, and persistently about the meaning of their faith. So scientific quest and theological inquiry both lead sooner or later to places of change, of significant, irrevocable, and radical change. Significant because the change is substantial and permanent. Irrevocable because you can't go back without compromising your integrity as a scientist or theologian. And radical in that it, has, it penetrates beyond objective theory into structures of the scientist or the theologian's personal identity and values. That's key. Radical, it goes to the heart of the person. So, let's give this a word, a term. Conversion. Change or decision that is significant, irrevocable, and radical. Now, uh, this is a, a, it's a scientific word. Uh, the chemists love it, right? Uh, it's a theological word. Probably you hear the word conversion. Oh, he became a Catholic. She became a Jew. The whole family became Muslim. That's, that's an example of significant irrevocable and radical change. But it's only an example. I want to use the word conversion, <laughs> bless you, to refer to any type of change in science, or in theology that is characterized in this way, okay? So the young 
diabetes scientist at the Jocelyn Center in Boston, uh, confronted by Barbara Corky's research at Boston University, the practically minded engineering student at Villanova who for the first time encounters quantum mechanics, or the white theology student from the main line who's confronted with, let's say, Nigerian tribal Christianity, all are faced with a radical redirection, right? alternative theories and methods that, that throw them off. To pursue this a little further, I'd like to bring Augustine in. Right? Uh, I'd like to do an, ana an anatomy of Augustine's conversion. You've all heard of Augustine, I presume. I thought I could make that presumption. Uh, so, one of the best known things about Augustine is his conversion uh, from playboy to priest when he was about 32, right? So he converted from sex to celibacy, from philosophy to faith, from cult to church, in the popular understanding of his story. Uh, and then once converted, he becomes the hammer of heretics and he lays down doctrinal highways atop the old Roman roads of North Africa and, and the European countryside. It's a simple model. He becomes a Christian, a bishop, and I'll tell you what's right. I know what's right now. However, uh, if you look, if you do an anatomy of his conversion, you take the time to open it up and, and look at it more closely, you see something very different. Uh, Augustine's conversion was not a one-off event where he is converted and things are clear and then he moves on as, as a Christian. And I would argue that a full understanding of Augustine's conversion needs to go beyond the, the struggle that preceded his baptism. You're all aware of that. You probably have read Confessions, many of you, and how he, he, you know, he goes uh, off to university, becomes a Manichaean, lives in that sect more or less until he in, in, goes to Milan in his early 30s. Um, uh, there he goes through Neoplatonism, time of skepticism, and uh, it all begins to make sense to him. He says, yeah, I've become a Christian, but I can't live without sex. Give me celibacy, Lord, but not yet. It's the most, that's the common prayer of undergraduates, I find, right? Uh, and so forth. But even that, although it's important and an interesting and fascinating study of religious sensibility and religious conversion, that does not give us the fullest sense of Augustine's conversion. I would argue that most of Augustine's conversion takes place after his baptism. Actually, after, after his conversion. Okay, so let me see. So, um, before we get to the Manichees, uh, Barbara, uh, or rather Catherine Conaber, I mentioned her this, this morning, as a professor at Bryn Mawr, has done a fascinating book called The Irrational Augustine. And uh, her argument is that even before he's baptized, when he's up in northern Italy uh, preparing for baptism, he writes four books within a period of six or seven months. It's incredible literary output. But in those books, the just retired teacher of rhetoric for the empire completely deconstructs how he understood learning and teaching in those four, the four dialogues, so-called Cassisiacum dialogues. So you can see, even after he becomes a Christian, he starts rethinking things. Uh, we know that his relationship with the empire, and he was number two in the empire. Uh, Augustine's successor as Rhetor later became emperor for a short time. He didn't last too long. I think he was dispatched rather quickly. Uh, but Augustine begins to rethink the aims of empire after his conversion, especially after 410 when Alaric invades Rome and, and the empire begins to disintegrate. Um, and through his writing of the city of God, he, he completely rethinks his understanding of society and, and the aims and goals of political power. The post-baptismal 
conversion that I want to concentrate on is Augustine's relationship with creation. We could use our term, the environment. Right? That shifts radically and completely. Yeah, I would say completely. His pre-baptismal understanding of conversion it can be understood in light of several things. First of all, uh, as you know, I presume you know, he, was a, he became a Manichaean. Uh, at the ha heart of Manichaean doctrine was a basic dualism. Matter is evil, stuff is evil, spirit is good. Dark, heavy, impenetrable, stony or fleshy matter comes from the evil one, from Haile, from devil, we might use the word. Light, airy, translucent, whispery, willowy spirit comes from God and is good. Creation, nature as we experience, is a mix of the two, always in conflict. Uh, salvation lies in separating the two, mm -hmm. escaping as much as possible from the heaviness of physical matter, ignoring the dull and obstinate uh, force of nature, and retreating into the light of the spiritual. The goal of religion is to free the spirit from matter. When he left the Manichaean community, when he moves up to Milan, uh, he gets involved with the Neoplatonist Christian community there. This reprise of Plato's thought from, from Plotinus in the third century uh, is also in its own way dualistic, much more sophisticated than Manichaeanism. And it taught a, an ascent, a spiritual, a gradual spiritual ascent, a discipline whereby you slowly left uh, your body behind and uh, ascended toward union with the one, with the truer part of genuine being, as it was called. So before his baptism, Augustine's flirtations uh, with anything spiritual or religious were both highly dualistic. Spirit is good, matter is bad. Also before his baptism, Augustine was a textual literalist. When he took the, the Jewish Bible, the Jewish book of Genesis, for example, he read it literally. He knew no other way. And he rejected it because it was, all, it was full of contradictions if you read it that way. He moves to Milan. He meets Bishop Ambrose and his priest, Simplicianus. And there, Augustine is decentered. His religious assumptions, though he's not yet Christians, are all thrown off. Augustine, first of all, introduces him to a different way of reading scripture. Not that I would compare myself to Ambrose, but as I was trying to introduce that young lady into a different way of reading scripture, Ambrose taught Augustine that you can look at different levels of interpreting a text, not just the literal, but the allegorical, the spiritual, the symbolic, the prophetic. And in doing that, Ambrose invites Augustine back to the book of Genesis that he had rejected when he was in college or university. And Ambrose challenged Augustine to re-engage with that text. And he does this for the next 30 years. He starts when he's around 30, 31, but as late as, uh, well, 420, we'll see it in a minute, he's still engaging with the book of Genesis. So you, the point is that when you get really decentered, when something really challenges you at the core of what you believe, it takes time to work it out. And Augustine works things out by writing. I think uh, from one of his late works, I think that as I wrote, I made progress. I think he did. As I wrote, I made, I made progress. So years later, we find him still engaging with the book of Genesis, still making progress. Just for an example, uh, Shortly after he is baptized, he's baptized in 387, so the next year he starts a book 
on Genesis against the Manichaeans. So he, he takes up the challenge right away. By the way, Catherine Conover does a, a fascinating recontextualizing of that text against the Manichaeans. She, it's a very ignored text by Augustine. Uh, she thinks it needs to be restudied. Then he starts a book in 393, he's still a priest, on the literal, literal interpretation of Genesis, unfinished. He never finished it. it gives you a, have you ever not finished a paper? It gives you a, or an experiment, it gives you a sense of how much he struggled with this. Books 11, 12, and 13 of Confessions, which he wrote 397, 401, are about creation. It's, it's basically deals with the first nine or 10 verses of Genesis. He takes up on the literal interpretation of Genesis again. Look how long he works on it. 14 years. 14 years. The City of God, especially, but not only Book 11. He continues. He finishes one book, and he, in Book 11, he continues in the next couple of years. And some people would add uh, parts of this book against an adversary of the law and the prophets around 420. He's wrestling with how do I make sense out of something I had dismissed? How do I do that? And it takes him a long time. Conversion is not a one-off event. Real, thoughtful conversion takes time. It's a struggle. I like to call this Augustine's ecological conversion. He had seen no place in his religious world for creation or the environment in salvation or redemption. It should be left behind. As he goes through this ecological conversion, he begins to luxuriate in the physical world, affirming over and over in his sermons and his books that all creation is from God, it's good, and it reflects the nature of the Creator. He extols the diversity of creation. Now remember, this is a, at this point, a fifth century scholar. You don't find this very often in other Latin texts, this type of language. And I, I thought it was, it's so stunning uh, that it's worth putting out there. Every creature has a special beauty proper to its nature. And when one ponders the matter well, these creatures are a cause of intense admiration and enthusiastic praise of their all-powerful maker. God creates them tiny in body, keen in sense, and full of life, so that we may feel a deeper wonder at the agility of a mosquito on the wing and that, than at the size of a beast of burden on the hoof, and may admire more intensely the works of the smallest ants than the burdens of the camels. I mean, any such joy over nature would have been anathema to a Manichaean and a curious dalliance to a Neoplatonist. In book 22 of The City of God, he sounds like a surgeon. What if we knew more precisely how all the body's parts are connected and adapted to one another? This is sense of, his sense of order is emerging here. But if we did know, then even the inward parts, which seem to have no beauty, would so delight us with their exquisite fitness as to afford a profounder satisfaction to the mind than the obvious beauty which gratifies the eye. I hope you nursing students, you medical students, get to that point where this, the balance of the systems of the body brings you delight. Right? So this Manichaean who once dismissed the physical world is the work of the devil, sounds like a member of the Sierra Club. Right? This former Neoplatonist could be uh, a ghostwriter for Greenpeace. It's, it's, it's remarkable when you think about it. So his 30-year his struggle with the book of Genesis leads to radically new affirmations, radically new affirmation. The physical world is not excluded from salvation or redemption. Uh, the multitude of diversity in the physical world actually, for him, is revelatory of what he calls the infinite complexity of divinity. 
So he's beginning to see in the, in the physical world a, what we would today call a sacrament. You can come to see God by the study of nature. What's more? Um, Augustine's relationship with nature is not just a matter of aesthetics, right? not just a matter of it's beautiful and interesting. He begins to develop a sense of responsibility for nature. We humans must take responsibility for what he called creation, what we would call the environment. Augustine was always on the outlook for uh, the effects of human sin. And he, mis he laments the misuse of creation in his own day. He thinks that we sin against creation in three ways, by greed, by aversion, and by exploitation. By greed, because instead of seeing nature as it is in itself, we see it only in light of its usefulness to us. So we devalue in nature what is not useful to us, and we exploit what is useful. This is a remarkable statement. Uh, it's, it's, it seems prophetic. Whether in ignorance of the place they hold in nature, or though we know, know it not, sacrificing them to our own convenience. He's talking about um, flies and mice. Right? Talking about aversion. And he says, what do, what do we do when we encounter things in nature that we find loathsome. Well, we, we try to wipe them out because we are ignorant of the place they hold in nature. He's talking about ecosystems here. Okay. Because we don't know and we sacrifice them to our own convenience. It's remarkable. He pushes, us, pushes this further and he begins to develop a sense of uh, responsibility that we share with one another to make sure that what we need from nature is available to every person. Mm -hmm. God asks back what he gave you, and from God you take what is enough for you. The superfluities of the rich are to the necessities of the poor. When you possess superfluities, you possess what belongs to others. So not only is nature good, from God and revelatory of God, we have, in our, in our relationship with God, we have a responsibility to each other in how we relate together to nature. Augustine, uh, Gary Wills calls Augustine, a uh, in terms of his ethical theory, a distribu distributionist. Uh, Augustine flirts, he goes back and forth in the idea of private property, but no private property if that means someone is not getting what they need. One further quote which I, I find fascinating, if you look closely at Confessions Book 13, uh, he's talking about God creating the grass and the trees and, and so forth. And he, he talks about the stout oak-like protection of a fruit-bearing tree. We are called upon to be like oak trees, strong trees that produce fruit. The, the oak, which in its benign strength can lift an injured person clear of the grasp of a powerful oppressor, right? Someone escaping, somebody who's attacking them goes up the tree, and furnish protective shade by the unshakable firmness of just judgment. Augustine is saying that the work of creation continues in our work of justice, in our making sure that resources are available to all who need them and are making sure that this, the uh, avenues of distribution are just and fair and equitable. That's the continu continuation of the work of creation. So you see how far he's moved using the scriptural text? Okay, what can we conclude from this anatomy of Augustine's ecological conversion? First, letting go, of, letting go of old assumptions or ways of thinking, and choosing new ones, is a kind of dying. It is not easy. And again, my friend at the Jocelyn Clinic says, she used that word, people are dying here. 
not the patients in the hospital, <laughs> but the researchers in the lab, because they're having to rethink so much. Right? We are so reluctant to let go of what we know. Uh, you know, Augustine uh, in his pre-baptism, give me celibacy, but not yet. I don't know that we can find that reluctance in his conversion, his ecological conversion, but it's a struggle. It's a struggle. Some uh, theologians have said Augustine was not successful, O'Connor and, and the other, O'Connor, right? The Jesuit, the Jesuit, of course, uh, said that Augustine was not successful. He always remains a Neoplatonist and a dualist. I think more recent research shows that to be a misreading. But scientists also know this volitional pain, this, this difficulty of letting go of something. Second, Augustine models for us this reconsideration by doing the hard work. He works at it. Uh, you just don't take a wand and wave over changes like this. Not a wand, not a scientific wand, not a theological wand. What you need are picks and shovels. You've got to tunnel around your old assumptions. Uh, you need to quarry out what you've been thinking, to excavate under your thought. Augustine went at it for 30 years. And as we saw in one of his works, he gave up. And that first, on the literal interpretation of Genesis, like an abandoned mine, he just left it. Scientists are aware of this type of work. I mean, think of Einstein's work on relativity. Think of Louis Pasteur's work in, uh, in uh, disease prevention. Or my wife's favorite, Madame Curie, which she reminds me every day, it was Madame, uh, I wrote it down, Skłodowska. She was Polish Curie and her work in radiology, in physics, and in chemistry. It takes work. And third, perhaps most importantly, significant, irrevocable, and radical change, whether it's scientific or theological, sooner or later involves a new anthropology for the person. By that I mean, a new understanding of what it means to be human. Go back to Augustine. Uh, I think one of the reasons it took him so long in reading about God's creation of man and woman is that all that time, Augustine is refashioning his own understanding of what it means to be human. When we, as a scientist or a theologian, work our way, will our way, through to a new way of seeing things, that type of work is so significant, it almost always involves uh, shifts in our understanding of what it means to be human. Uh, that's a topic that I'd like to explore a little more. Um, so, my proposal is, is very simple. One of the places where theologians and scientists can meet in mutual respect and understanding to explore and talk, perhaps in the uh, Science and Humanities program, is on this level of what happens in our discipline as a physicist, as a biologist, as a theologian, as a, uh, I don't know, a poet. What happens when the ground shakes under my feet and I need to reassess everything. That's a meeting place where we can meet, that we can come together and talk and share. Augustine took 30 years to read for his ecological conversion. The world population around 430 when he died was 300 million. The whole world, for what we can estimate. It's seven billion, and in 30 years it will be nine billion. We don't have 30 years, because I think it's in the, in the study of ecology where scientists and theologians must come together. 
Peace. Questions? Thanks, Joe, for the dialogue. work. We don't have time for everybody to tell their stories, but I'm sure they got a few questions. <laughs> As uh, someone who teaches evolution here, I, I was struck by uh, Augustine marveling at the fitness of a mosquito. Yeah. He was the maker of the created mosquito. I, if he were alive today, I think perhaps he would be saying, isn't it wonderful that we've had millions of years of mutations that have resulted in the yeah. fitness of a mosquito? And then you go back to the prime cause behind that. Where did the mutation come from? Yeah. Only a biologist could love mosquitoes, but we understand. <laughs> yes? Um, I would really like to thank you for your talk. Um, I'm in philosophy, um, so I'm sneaking in new scientists and theologians <laughs> over here. But um, I've been struggling with, lately with the, uh, the young Augustine's, I guess, rational approach and the, um, and the uh, difference between the young Augustine and the, and the and Augustine as he develops. The, and before uh, your talk, I, I couldn't help but think, oh, well, he's a bishop, and so he has to actually deal with people and bodies and, you know, um, that's, and that's true. You know, children and you know, people of different um, religions and, uh, and sex at the time. Um, do, sex, like Donatus and whatnot. Um, and, um, <laughs> but perhaps it's something even more in his work on Genesis, perhaps he's going from his, like, this dualistic notion of the, of, of the Neoplatonists and of the Manichaeans and of other religious or scholars at the time is a, uh, I guess, a phallic-centered um, theory. It's the, that there is the mind, which is pure, and then there's the body. And the mind that's pure is, is thought of as male, and then the body is right. female and yeah. dirty. And so what Augustine does is he gives us a theory that is not phallocentric. He gives us a way where spirituality and humanity can be human instead of male, and then women can fit in somehow. Instead, we can actually get something through his work on Genesis that is the creation of man and woman that isn't just, well, reason is what it is to be human, which is, you know, Aristotle. Um, so reason, and then there's everything else. So I, I really want to yeah. really thank you for that, because I really, you gave me a lot of places to look. <laughs> Look at uh, Catherine Conabares, mm -hmm. the irrational Augustine, because uh, sh she uses some of the language you just used. She admits that's a very dangerous title for a book on Augustine, the irrational Augustine. Uh, but sh she would say, in fact, that Augustine, in the Cassisicum Dialogues, decenters reason. Now, whether or not he's consistent in his application of that to uh, his understanding of men and women and salvation is another question. But we're talking about the fourth and fifth century. Um, he goes a lot further than many people give him credit for. There is a feminist, I think she's Catholic theologian, uh, Scandinavia. Uh, Terry Borison. Borison uh, does a lot of work on that and she, she says, uh, we need to look carefully at, at the pains Augustine took to establish the equality of men and women. Whether or not he's successful in the end, but, but hey, the guy, I mean, he's trying to figure this stuff out before anybody else did. And he gives us the language. So I think there's a lot there to go back. You should be our next feminist Augustinian scholar. That Make sure she... That's wonderful. <laughs> Great. Anyone else? Questions? Nurses? Giuseppe. Just a, a, something that's beginning to, to interest me is with the ecology, with the ecosystem in which we live, there's the studies that are saying how significant or insignificant, or necessary or unnecessary, is the human person in that whole system, and how significant are these microbes that are mm. being studied? Are they more significant yeah. than we are? One of the problems with our response to sustainability, or lack of response to it, um, 
is it's not only that it's hard to give up our big cars. When I brought the students back from Italy last week, and we landed in Boston, and they said, oh, here we are back now in the land of big cars. Because <laughs> they were just marveling at the uh, mosquito-like cars, you know, the Vespa. Uh, but it's not just that we have to sacri make sacrifices for sustainability, which we certainly have to do. And in first world countries, we're still not very good at that, really. But more than that, a full response to sustainability, I think, requires a new anthropology. And I believe that that new anthropology, that new understanding of what it means to be human, and that's your question, it can only be developed by scientists and theologians working together, and that's why I think this science and humanities idea is so important. You're not going to get theologians developing a new anthropology for st sustainability on their own, and you're not going to get scientists doing it on their own, but together it could be powerful. But we don't have time. That's the scary thing, you know. I mean, it was, what, 85 degrees here last yeah. week? And you say, well, that's a fluke. Mm -hmm. um, it's crucial. I, I think in the past, dialogue between scientists and theologians was an academic nicety. It's a global necessity now, I think. Now, it is happening. It's happening in lots of places, but we need to encourage it. By the way, did you ever think there, were, there was no, in terms of uh, the ecological movement and the science of, ec of ecology in the field, uh, there's been no papal ca condemnation of uh, Earth Day, for example. No, it's interesting that this is one uh, movement in science where religion was right along with it. Politically, I know there are issues, but in terms of religion, by and large, um, it's hand in glove. That, that's a good thing. Yes? So, I'm an environmental scientist. And, um, Romance languages? What's that? What? No, no, no. I, I study environmental science. Oh, environmental a, science. I'm an ecologist. Um, and one of the things, and I, I was curious about your, because I, I think the connection between science and religion in this app with, this, with your topic of ecology me has always seemed very clear um, and it was always something that I thought was a way to get the general public um, mm -hmm. much more on board with environmental issues and I was just want, like I was sort of wondering your opinion on that like if that was one way of maybe not necessarily combining science and theology from an academic perspective but mm -hmm. but almost as an outreach yes sort of yeah, I, I think if religious, you know, if churches and synagogues and mosques and, and temples can get mobilized to sensitize their congregations or, or adherents to ecological issues, that, that can only help. And a lot of, I mean, you see, if you visit a lot of uh, uh, Sunday school classrooms or, sat, you know, Sunday school te temples, the temple in Andover, the Jewish temple, uh, a lot of ecological themes going on there. So it's happening, and I think it's important. The problem uh, w with Christianity is this, Augustine's ecological conversion was basically ignored. And, uh, oh yeah, yeah, we well, read the book of Genesis, fine, he changed, it wasn't a Manichaean anymore, most people think. But in terms of Christianity and its development, uh, Christianity rolls over into um, the, the Protestant ethic, if we could, and the uh, Industrial Revolution and all of that, you know, e e building on a basically Western Christian culture. So Christianity has been identified with the exploitation of nature, whereas indigenous religions have been identified with respect for and living in the rhythms of nature. And that's true to a certain extent. I mean, uh, that really, that's one of the major themes of uh, Tolkien's trilogy. Tolkien was one of the early environmentalists. The hobbits are symbolic of uh, native indigenous peoples. Um, but what I'm saying is that in Augustine, we actually had, we didn't, we just didn't listen to him for centuries. But 
So I say yes, on a popular level and on a theoretical level, there's, there's a lot here to mine. I wonder too, if in listening to Augustine, we can listen to him not through the evolution that everybody thinks is only connected to biology, but we can listen to him as an admirer of the world and be and see evolution through the eyes of a physicist. In other words, going way back beyond any chain of being, uh, mm -hmm. living beings, so that instead of having to say we're descended from apes, as if somehow that were a problem, we can talk about the plan that Augustine was trying to propose um, by reading Genesis through the eyes of Paul. And we mm. get a chance, in other words, to evaluate not just those beings that are living, but all matter. Mm. I, I think if Augustine were alive today, you know, if Augustine were alive today, he'd be a, an astro a nuclear physicist. I, I think. That, I just think that those were the metaphysical questions are arising today, and that's where he'd be, and probably a little bit of an evangelical preacher thrown in there, but uh, he'd be right in the heart of all of this. Okay, well, you've, you all have homes to go to. Uh, you've been here much too long, so let's go.